Good morning, Parkside. So excited to uh, worship again with you this morning online. Here we are uh, in the youth room this time, welcoming you to our worship service. We are looking forward to an, a really awesome time together. Uh, Aaron has prepared uh, the worship team uh, to lead us, and then also Pastor Jim has a, uh, a very practical sermon on some of the questions that people often have about salvation. Um, but as we, or before we get into that, I just want to remind everyone, we have a lot of other resources, uh, both on the website and on our Facebook page uh, for you to access. So if you haven't been to the website, parksidecampverde.com, and you can go to the church at home. Uh, when you click that, there's resources for youth ministry. We're doing a, a Zoom youth group for high schoolers every Wednesday at seven o'clock, and there's a link on there for that. Uh, there's also a reading plan for your students to get into. Um, they can comment and chat together. Uh, and then also we have a whole bunch of stuff for children's ministry from uh, preschool down all the way up through um, kind of the, the preteen, the between kids as we call them. Uh, so please uh, make use of all of those resources and we look forward to an amazing time of worship this morning. So let me just go to God in prayer as we um, open our, our hearts and our minds to the truths of his word um, and as we, we give back to him in worship and through our, our giving as well. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your church. Thank you that um, we have an amazing building uh, even though we can't use it right now. Uh, and thank you that we know that our, our church, what Parkside really is, is the family, the people that we love, um, that are here, um, even in their own homes, worshiping together, uh, learning, discipling, uh, picking up the phone and calling each other, being that community, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for uh, Pastor Jim as he uh, preaches your word. And I pray that we would all understand a little bit more about salvation this morning. We thank you for all that you have given to us, especially uh, Christ as he died on the cross and rose again to be our risen Savior, our coming King. And Father, we look forward to all that you have for us uh, today, uh, this week, and the coming weeks. And we trust you in the midst of all of it. We love you and uh, we ask for a good morning. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And with that, we'll turn things over to Aaron and the worship team. Oh, my God. 
chosen. Good morning, friends and family at Parkside Community Church. It is Sunday, and we are so glad to be with you today, as well as those watching from other parts of the world on the World Wide Web, right? It's good to be together. And it's no mistake to say that the days we are in, these COVID-19 days, we hear about it all the time on the news, you're probably sick of hearing about it, but they're uncertain days. We just don't know. We hear different reports about how long it's going to last, when it's going to stop, when it's not going to stop, who's vulnerable, who's not vulnerable. It's interesting to me, you know, when this all started, you guys, I mean, it's not interesting, but it's a little bit frustrating when um, the commodities that we depend on uh, came into short supply. I mean, for, for example, did you ever think you'd go to the community center, Bashes, and uh, just to get some hand soap or toilet paper, and find out they were in such short supply? I mean, how many of us face uncertainty even when we go online to order something from Bashaz and find out they don't have it? I was thinking just a little bit about uh, the whole hand soap, sanitary soap stuff. I mean, if people just thought through the effects of hoarding these items, maybe they'd change. I don't know. Everyone's telling us how important it is to wash our hands, to protect ourselves and others from spreading the virus and the bacteria, right? Okay, so if one person hoards all of the soap, how are the rest of us supposed to wash our, hand, to wash our hands to protect the hoarder? Think about it. It's so true. Whatever a man sows, he also reaps. We all have uncertainties. Businesses are uncertain. We're certain about our, uncertain about our financial future. Our government has uncertainties. We've added about $5 trillion in debt over the last six weeks. We're uncertain about the future of our health, our family's health, and how the virus will affect our loved ones. I know I am. We live in a time of great uncertainty. But I believe the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today, it's Romans chapter 8, will provide four certain truths that God will give us to anchor our souls in these uncertain days we face. Before we look at the Word of God, we need to pray. So, would you pray with me, please? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we come boldly before your throne and pray that you would answer the cries of our heart. Father, we pray that we would worship you, that we would praise you. We're so wonderfully filled with the hope and the joy of knowing we belong to a God who never makes mistakes and that everything that happens is according to plan and purpose that we might grow to love you more that we might share you with others more Father help us do that help us to understand Romans chapter 8 we pray and encourage your word encourage your people as we get into your word this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at the whole chapter. In this passage, Paul is speaking to believers in Rome, 
who are under incredible uncertainties themselves. Uncertainty of persecution or not, discouragement, uh, defeat, and some even death. After developing God's teaching on our salvation in chapters 1 through 7, Paul brings us to chapter 8 to share with us the truths we can all be certain of. And we know that because he uses this word, therefore. Okay? There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's how the passage begins. We are faced with many uncertainties. Our uncertainties are often answered by means of asking a question. Now, I've just read a passage, but here's the question that many people struggle with. Let's give a listen. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, but I'm never certain of what God thinks of me. Will I still be condemned if I don't live a perfect life? That is a great question. And God gives us a wonderful answer in Romans 8, 1 through 4, 31 through 35 for our first point. And that answer to that uncertainty that was just asked, or the question that was just asked, is we will never be condemned by God. Let me read it again. Romans 8, 1 through 4, and then I'm going to read 31 through 35. There is therefore now, what? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the what spirit. Then in verse 31 and 35, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Who shall ever separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword? The whole point of Romans is to prove to us that our condemnation for all of our sin has been taken away by Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And our condemnation is gone because He took our sin, past, present, future sin, and He nailed it to the cross. You ever hear somebody say that guy nailed it? Jesus nailed our sin to the cross. We're reminded in the first four chapters of Romans that following the law, which Paul mentions in verses 1 through 4, or 2 through 4 in chapter 8, following the law could never, ever save us. Or we could say the Ten Commandments. Let's just use that as a shortened version, right? Why could, why is it impossible for us to save ourselves by doing the Ten Commandments? Because we fail them. We have. The law never had the power to save us. It only has the power to show all of our sin and that we need a Savior. I've asked people before, have you come to the place in your spiritual life that you know if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? And many people say, I hope so. I think so. I, man, I hope it all works out. And then when I ask him the question, how are you going to, um, to get to heaven? I mean, if God said, why should, I, why should I let you know my heaven, what would you say? And normally the response is, I've tried to do the Ten Commandments. I've heard this many, many times. And I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but I asked the person, can you name me five of those commandments? And I have never had anybody who could name at least five of the Ten Commandments. How can we know that we're obeying something if we don't even know what they are? And history proves us, and the Bible proves to us that we've failed those commandments. And if we've even failed one of them, we've failed them all. 
That's why we need Jesus. And when I put my faith in Christ, when you put your faith in Christ, you became and I became one with Christ. That's why Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are, what? In Christ. When I put my faith in Christ, I become one with Christ. Being in Christ means I have been born again through faith in him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the word condemnation is here. There is therefore now no condemnation. That word condemnation is only found two other times in the New Testament. And it deals specifically, I'm going to put my Bible down, it deals specifically with those guilty of sin and serving the just demands of the penalty for that sin. And do you remember what the just demands or the penalty for our sin is? Remember Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and fallen short of the, of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Death in its fullest sense, means to be separated from God for all eternity. But when we are united with Christ by faith, something incredible happens. It's called being saved. It's called being delivered. Um, and here's the incredible truth, men and women, concerning our salvation in Christ. Every sin, I'd like you to hold on to this, Okay, because this, this will blow your spiritual mind. Every sin of every believer is forgiven forever, the moment you receive Christ. No one can condemn us because God has taken our condemnation away. Take note again, he not only says it in verse 1, he also says, says that truth in verse... Uh, 31 through 35. What can separate us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That word elect scares people, but here's the truth, and we'll discover it next week as Pastor Mike shares, is that God did choose before the foundation of the world, and he chose me, and he chose you. If you know Christ, you know you're chosen. But you also had to make a decision. You also had to choose him. And so that truth, although it's difficult to understand, it was Spurgeon who said the, the reality of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility run like two train tracks throughout all eternity parallel to one another. We are responsible, but God is sovereign. And no one can condemn the believer because God has declared him not guilty. I mean, Christ himself is our judge. The Bible says in verse 34 that Christ intercedes for us. He is interceding as a lawyer, in essence. We know from 1 John that says that I write to you, John writes, nor that, that you might not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That word advocate means lawyer. It also is is tied to this word intercessor as well, although the word intercessor speaks specifically of prayer, that Jesus is interceding for us as our advocate as well as our prayer partner before the Father right now. So Christ is not only our lawyer, he's our judge. He died to pay our debt. And not only that, he's also our jury. So if the lawyer says he's not guilty, if the judge says he's not guilty, and the jury comes back and says, not guilty, guess what? You're not guilty. The case is closed. The guilt for our sin was nailed to the cross, and Jesus has set us free. That's past sin, present sin, and future sin. By the way, how much of your sin was yet future when Christ died for you? All of it. I've heard preachers say, they said, no, Christ only died uh, for the sin that you committed up until the point that you confess Christ. And you got to keep confessing your sin or you're not really forgiven. In fact, I heard one guy say, it's going to be terrible for some Christians they stand before God with unconfessed sin. Let me tell you this. Christ paid the debt for our sin. And it's gone. We confess our sin to right our relationship with God. It's not for God's benefit. It's for ours to know that as we agree with God about our sin, we know we're already forgiven by God. 
Why do we listen to Satan's taunts of condemnation when God himself says, you're not guilty? God will not condemn anyone. He will not condemn anyone who has put their trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. God knows everything there is to know about each one of us. Do you have any life secrets you hope no one finds out about? God already knows. He knows how we were. He knows how we are right now. And he knows how we will live for the rest of our lives. He sees it all in stark reality. Yet he says, I am satisfied with you because I am satisfied with my son to whom you belong. When I look at you, God says, I see my son. And there is, therefore, as a result of seeing my son, when I look at Jim Baugh, there is therefore now no condemnation. And you can put your name in there too. When God sees you, he sees his son. So you can come boldly before him in prayer. Why? Because you're so righteous? No, because Jesus is so righteous and he's given you his righteousness as a gift. We can be certain of our place in God's forever family, free from condemnation, even when we fail and don't live a perfect life. God will not condemn anyone and everyone who's put their trust in Christ. In fact, when we stop saying in our own strength or t stop trying in our own strength to quote-unquote live godly and instead surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit to live through us, we'll walk in freedom. Let's hear our next question to address an issue of uncertainty we'd we often face. All right, here's the question. I was told that I can receive Jesus but not have the Holy Spirit. How can I be certain that the Holy Spirit lives in me? Now, that is a great question as well. I've struggled with that question too. In fact, when I was younger, I heard that not every Christian has the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit can leave me when I sin. But all those uncertainties are true. I also heard that unless I have some extraordinary uh, spiritual gift, I don't have the Holy Spirit. Someone once said, unless you speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Is that biblical theology? Is that what the Bible teaches? Absolutely not. Here's a certain truth for uncertain times, and that is this certain truth. If you know Christ and you've trusted him, you have the person and power of the Holy Spirit in you. And collectively, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have been born again by faith in Christ, we have the person and power of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul reminds us in, in verse uh, 5 of chapter 8 through 17, this is a big passage, but Paul says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It, is, it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, here's the point I want to bring to your attention. You, however, as a believer, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to God, does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Look at verse 26 and 27. Likewise, Paul says, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We have the person and power of the Holy Spirit in us irrevocably. He is not and cannot be removed. Why? Because if Christ is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us. Paul reminds us in this passage that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who are according to the flesh, and there are those who are according to the Spirit. 
Now that phrase, according to, literally means the bent of their lives. In other words, they, there are those whose lives are completely bent against the Lord. They cannot hear from the Spirit because they are still slaves to the flesh. Why? Because they have not united or been identified with Christ by faith. They do not have freedom in Christ because Christ has never set them free. They are self-righteous, self-determined, self-condemned. They may be religious, but they're not redeemed. And they are characterized as being in, that is completely controlled by, and immersed in the what? Flesh. Now, the flesh is not your skin. Okay? The flesh is another word for the idea that I can do what I need to do without Christ. It also refers to the old nature. Now, do Christians still struggle with the flesh? Yes. But according to God, the flesh is no longer our identity. It is no longer who we really are. You see? Because Christians have been given a brand new nature, and that new nature is God's nature. So, verse 9, we are not in the flesh, we are in the Spirit. And what happens, how do we know when we are in the Spirit, if Christ is in us. That's what Paul says. You can't have Christ in your heart and in your life without also having the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, the triune Godhead is mentioned and spoken of over and over again. When you come to faith in Christ, you get, in essence, the full meal deal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit come to make residence in you. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that we have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the flesh. Now, we can fall into the flesh. That is, we can fall into those old habits that we had before we met Christ. And we can mimic or, or give evidence of the flesh, but that's not who we really are. And as a Christian, if you get convicted because of your sin, not condemned, but you can convicted, that's a sign that you're a part of the family of God. Because the conviction of the Holy Spirit is real. We know when, we've, when our hearts are cold towards God. We know that we're walking in the power of the flesh and not the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're not in the flesh, we are in the Spirit. And how do we know we're in the Spirit? If Jesus Christ lives in us. And how do we know Christ lives in us? We know because we have made that commitment, that decision to open our hearts and lives to Christ. And when that commitment is made, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell, literally to make His home in us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 reminds us that our bodies are the temple where the Holy Spirit lives. And He never leaves, by the way. He takes up residence. In fact, the Holy Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we belong to the Lord. Now, how does He do that? Do we hear a voice like this? You know, you are mine. I am the Holy Spirit. I, I'll never say what God can and cannot do. But I will say this. The Holy Spirit's whiz, witness to my spirit and to the spirit of a believer is very real. And if you know that witness, you can, you can just kind of like say amen right where you're at. The confirmation of the Spirit's witness comes to us to the promises of God in the Bible and this inner sense of the assurance that He is with me and lives in me. It is subjective, but it also is very objective. In fact, the Holy Spirit will never tell you to do something that is contrary to the Word of God. He gives us freedom from those things that used to paralyze us in fear. And He gives us strength to overcome sin's invitation. The Holy Spirit also convicts us of sin. As I've said before, He doesn't condemn us, but He does convict us. And when we're convicted of sin, what do we do? We confess it to the Lord and we turn from it with the strength and power that the Holy Spirit gives us. And we can be certain that the Holy Spirit lives in us as believers. And the next part of this passage tells us why. It also answers this question we've all struggled with. And here's the question. Let's listen to it. I've heard people say that if I love Jesus and follow him, I can be certain to never have any more problems. Is this really true? That's another great question. And God has an answer for us in verses 18 through 30. 
And the truth is, the certain truth for uncertain times, that truth is this, will I experience suffering as a Christian? The answer is, absolutely. We will experience suffering as a part of God's plan for our lives. Paul writes this in verse 18. This is such a powerful passage. For I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy compared with the glory that is being revealed to us. For the whole creation waits and eagerly longs for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. We have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, and he prays on our behalf and encourages us and helps us. But I want to go down to um, verse 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also, what? Glorified. Paul reminds us in this passage of the fact that everything and everyone are in a constant state of decay. It's called entropy. Not only is the whole universe winding down, so is everyone around us. Scientists tell us we start to die the moment we're born. And we discover that more prominently as we get older. You know, a guy gets up, he goes, man, this has been a great day. My bones don't hurt. My, my ankles, you know, still feel strong. My muscles are not sore, but I got to get out of bed and go to work, you know. And the reality of it is we do. We all got to get up, put our feet on the floor, and take the next step forward even though our bodies groan and they ache, and they start aching a little bit more the older we get. I know that. But have you ever befriended, got friended from someone on Facebook that you haven't seen in 30 years? You've got to be at least 40 to do this. So I'm talking to the older gen. But initially, when I get friended by someone I haven't seen in 30 or 40 years, it's like this. Oh, wow, Bob Biffdrop sent me a friend invitation on Facebook. Then when you click on Bob's page, it's like, Bob, what happened, buddy? <laughs> Honey, come here. Can you believe that's Bob Biffdrop from high school? He looks so old. And that's true for all of us. It is. It's true for all of us. We all get older. Hopefully, we get better as we get older, right? But one day... God will not only replace our bodies with new ones, hallelujah, say, say somebody out, out there in the internet land, he's also going to redeem and renew the whole creation. Don't need a, a green new deal, it's going to be God's new deal. In the meantime, we're part of a planet and a world system that it's not only falling apart, it can also be hostile to followers of Jesus. I'm often reminded of the old hymn, this world is not my home, I'm just a what? Passing through? That's true. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, that every believer is right now a citizen where? In heaven. Peter calls us aliens and strangers to the world in 1 Peter 1, 21. You ever wonder if aliens really exist? You bet they do. Go look in the mirror, Christian, and you'll see a real live alien. It's true. The world is not our home. That's why we go through suffering as Christians. God's truth is usually counter to what the world tells us is true. And when we walk in the truth and don't do what the world says, the world says, stop doing that. We want you to do what we want you to do. We play the flute, you dance. We want you to live like we live. We want you to think like we live. 
We want you to eat what we eat, drink what we drink, and do what we do. And when we don't, as Christians, when we walk as aliens and strangers, when we live a life that is contrary to the world, guess what happens? It's convicting. And the world doesn't like it. Believers will go through suffering. They're going through suffering around the world today. Not because God no longer loves us. We suffer because we no longer love the world. That's why. We love Jesus. We have a new king. And on a positive note, let's remember that when we suffer, God has a plan in mind to cause everything we go through to turn out for our good and his glory in that pain. Romans 8.28 tells us that. But I do think too often we pull verse 28 out of context and define what's good according to our personal definition, and that may not be the good that God intends through our pain. For example, oh, I lost my job, but God has a plan, right? And I got a new job, and I'm making three times as much money, and I'm living in five times as big a house. That's good. Well, is it good? We don't, we don't know. That's not necessarily the defined good that God has in this text, because we want to put the verse, Romans 8, 28, in its context to understand what the good really is. So what is the good that all things, both trials and triumphs, suffering and strength, what does it all work together for? Verse 29 tells us that we become more and more like, I heard it, Jesus, from the inside out. I know you've heard the catchphrase, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. So Romans 8, 28 through 30, God tells us what his plan is. And that is to allow us to go through suffering so we become more like his son, Jesus. And it's in the middle of times of suffering that we're often confronted with more uncertainties. Does God really love me? I mean, if he really loved me, why am I going through this suffering? And here's what that uncertainty sounds like in a question. All right, so our fourth and final question. Let's hear it. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior, but when I do something I know is wrong, I'm not certain if God loves me anymore. Does he still love me? Another excellent question. Have you ever felt that uncertainty before? I know I have. Especially when I go through suffering. I immediately think it's because God no longer loves me or God's angry at me or God's mad at me. I used to think that. I don't think that anymore. I know that when I go through suffering, God has a plan. Why? Because he loves me. The question is answered for us in Romans 8, 31 through 39, and that is, we will never be separated from God's love and care for us. Let me read it. What then should we say to these things? If God is for us, who should be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. I think if we were being killed all day long, we, and we were being like sheep to be slaughtered, we'd be wondering, does God still love us? And the answer is yes. Paul writes, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Literally, we are super conquerors. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the big kahuna from this whole passage, men and women. God, the eternal, all-powerful, the one that nothing can stop, the one that nothing can debilitate, the one that nothing can defeat, this God, the sovereign king, is for us. And nothing can separate us from his love. 
Paul paints this beautiful picture of God's love to help us possess and be empowered by this truth, this certain truth that nothing will ever be able to separate you from his love. When you were, when you were at your worst, sinful, rebellious, rejecting anything and everything God had for you, God still gave you his very best. He gave you and he gave me his son in order to save us. And since he, since he did that, since he did that, will he not also give us everything we need? Satan can't separate us from God's love. The demons can't destroy us. Death is the only glorious door we go through to get to a place where pain and sorrow and suffering don't exist. Nothing can separate us from God's measureless love. Pain can't. Disappointment can't. Anguish can't. Yesterday, today, tomorrow cannot separate us from God's love. The loss of my dearest loved one can't separate me from the love of God. Death can't. Life can't. Riots, war, hunger, neurosis, disease, COVID-19. None of these, nor all of them heaped together, can ever budge the fact that I am and you are dearly loved, completely forgiven, and forever free from the condemnation of our sin through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Hallelujah. Let me close with a personal question and invitation. Are you certain these truths are certainly yours? If not, would you just open your heart to Christ? He loves you. He died for you. When he was on the cross, he whispered your name. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows your sin. He knows your sorrow. He knows your suffering. He knows your pain, he knows your past, he knows your present, and he also knows your future. And he died for the, on the cross for you, and he rose from the dead. And he said, whosoever will may come, if anyone will confess me, call on the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. And men and women, you're listening today on the internet, would you do, if you have any sense of uncertainty concerning your own relationship with Christ, all you need to do is say, Jesus, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again. I confess my sin. I turn from it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, save me and make me yours. You pray that prayer with full certainty. I can tell you, you are now a child of the living God. And now you need to start growing. Please spend time today. Let all of us, as, a, as believers in Christ, spend time to lift our voices in praise and thanks to God in spite of the uncertainties and the difficulties we face in the days ahead. You and, I can, you and I can praise him for the fact that he is for us, that nothing can separate his love from us. His love never fails. He will take care of me. He will take care of you. He will take care of all of us. He certainly will. May God bless you, Parkside. May God keep you, strengthen you, and Father, in Jesus' name, may we worship you for your unstoppable love. Amen. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. Yeah.